All right, we're live. Hello, everybody. Joanna here. And today we're going to be talking about uh, a song for a bone. I almost said the Lions of Alvar song because that was our last discussion. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but a different GGK book. So a song I love for your bone. cover. <laughs> I have this one. I have unfortunately a very boring cover. Uh, I'm the only one not with nice. my book out. I feel very ashamed right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have, have a such a beautiful cover? cover. She does. She has a different cover and it's beautiful. I do. Oh, wow. So I had, um, I'll pull the photo up on my phone. I actually bought the hard cover for my husband for Christmas. So it's hidden away so that he can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mostly read the ebook, um, but I do like the cover because yeah, it's it's nice. I don't know, can can people see this? It's I too... can see it. Yeah, yeah I, I know so... which cover it is. I yeah. can yeah. see it, but yeah. I know all the covers. <laughs> do you want to just like that cover because it has her on it? So that's yeah. kind of it does. Yeah. Well, the, I got the idea for the thumbnail because yes, I love that cover. Uh, I I bought I. Just to give a little bit of a story, and we are starting spoiler free, um, just to give a little bit of a story. The reason I chose to go with this for my second GGK book, well, I was actually curious about it when I saw Jake's review a year ago because he mentioned Madrigals and that had me excited. But specifically, it was because of Jimmy from the Fantasy Network because he read this book and while he was reading it, he reached out to me and he said, Juana, I think you will love this book. And I told him I would credit him in the live show that yes, he is the reason I chose this as my second GGK book. And I even mentioned him in my video, uh, my five-star review video, even though I don't read books, about books that other booktubers have recommended to me that I, mm -hmm. recommendations I didn't ask for. So that was one <laughs> that he was just convinced. And I feel like he knows my taste very well. I actually really trust Jimmy. And he was right on with this. This is a new favorite for me. Loved it. And then when I bought this special edition, because I was so convinced I would love it, uh, it was funny because he I sent him a picture and he said, that looks like you. So <laughs> that was why I went ahead and did the thumbnail the way I did. A thumbnail was born. I loved the thumbnail yes. so much. It was so good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. That was fun. <laughs> I had a lot of fun making that. So yeah. Hello, everybody. And uh, we are going to be starting this spoiler free. Hi, Jared. And really excited to talk about this book because it was, as I mentioned in my review, a very special read. Jake Bishop also has a wonderful spoiler-free review. And of course, Jimmy also from the Fantasy Network also has an amazing review and kind of touches on some different uh, themes, I think. So I think we yeah. all kind of touched on different things about this book, which is kind of cool to see the different reviews for it. And I think it deserves all the reviews, all the praise, because... I mean, it's a fantastic standalone, and we just don't have enough of those in fantasy. I'm trying to find right here my spoiler-free banner, and I realized I forgot to do that beforehand. Oh, here we go. Non-spoiler. There we go. All right. So first of all, for everyone here, everyone has at least read The Lions of Alversan beforehand, and some of us in the chat, including Jake Bishop and Josh, uh, have both read several GGK books at this point. So maybe we could talk about where we rank this book compared to our other <laughs> GGK book experiences or just any special thoughts about this particular book that you want to say spoiler free. And so we'll go ahead and start with Laura. So this book I really enjoyed, but it is not as strong for me as Lions is. I felt I loved Lions. Lions, I, I gushed about it in our live stream when we had that conversation last time. And I just felt more drawn to the female characters in Lions than I did in this book. Um, that's not to say that I didn't like the female characters in this book. I did. The prose is as beautiful as ever. I highlighted several examples of just his poetic way of speaking because really it just it's so much of his work reads like poetry to me it's so beautiful and this is a book that I will say the audiobook narrator does a phenomenal job because there's song in this and he actually does sing the songs and has a beautiful voice so if someone is interested or really likes immersion reading I highly recommend this as a good candidate because there are quite a few proper names in this book. That was something that I actually had a little bit of a harder time with compared to Lions. I found that there were way more characters in this that like you needed to kind of remember who they were. And that could get confusing in audiobook 
solely, but if you're reading them in tandem with one another or immersion reading, I think it makes for a really strong, strong candidate for that. But overall, really enjoyable read. Uh, he's really just a marvelous writer. Yeah, I totally agree with that. In fact, that's what I did. I used both audiobook and physical, the physical book. And when I read the prologue, I actually specifically, like, I wrote out a whole entire chart of who people were <laughs> and their relationships to yeah. each other. And that helped me so much. And Jake, I know in your review, you talked about that because in the Lions of Alversan, we actually get the cast list yes. uh, right at the beginning, but we don't in this book and it really could have used it. Yes. Yeah, so every time Guy Gavril K writes a book, he flips a coin to decide if he wants to have a Dramatis personate. This is my theory because uh, about half his books have a kit list of characters mm -hmm. and about half of them don't. And there's seemingly no correlation between like how many characters there are and whether the, it's almost like on the books with more characters, he's like, well, I don't feel like writing all of those down. They'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> the books with, so yeah, this is a thing. Now I find I generally am able to follow them pretty well because they're pretty memorable, but I, I do. I, I, I often wonder if I ever, to, actually I, I should, if I ever have a chance to talk to Guy Gavel K, I want to ask him, how do you choose whether you include a character list before a book or not? Because uh, I don't know if you guys do Serentine next, that has the most characters, no principal character <laughs> list. Um, Is that uh, Sailing to Sarantum? Is that? Sailing to Sarantium, yes. That, okay, it's my the, husband has read that one too and really enjoyed it. Yeah, so that's the duology. Yeah. So yeah. it's Dunk Serantium, Lord of Emperors, which is is my yeah. personal favorite of all his works. Okay. As for our bone, our bone is like in the middle upper tier for me. I do slightly prefer lions. I uh I sl just I, I think the framing of like the story for lions where you have like the upcoming religious conflict with people you're invested in who are kind of on both sides and it's really like unclear what side to root for. I, I just slightly prefer that. I also think I had a much less emotional connection to the songs in this because I'm terrible at reading songs in books. I still love the book. I imagine if I had the same emotional reaction to the songs as it seems at least maybe all three of you did, that that might move it up a bit. So this is probably like my sixth favorite Guy Gavel K book or something. It's in that range. Yeah. Well, this is why I'm yeah. also so happy to have Josh here because Josh as a fellow music educator, <laughs> you can appreciate the songs, hopefully. I know you teach orchestral music, but give us your picture, your thoughts on this. This this for me is, I've read three by Guy Gavro K, and I gave them all five stars. I mean, this is a new, absolutely a new favorite author for me. And I can't wait to read more, but this was by far my favorite of the three. Um, as okay. much as I loved Lions, which was ahead of the three. And I think part of it was the music connections, but I also like the setting as well. There's just something about, I don't know, this quasi French setting that I just really connected with it very early. Um, something I've talked about before on a video, and I think Joanna, we've talked about it. Like in my musical training, I had a mentor that always talked about composers. If you could find the two things that they do really well, you can understand a lot about that composer, you know, and their compositions. And I've been trying to have correlations with that with authors. And I think I do that as well. And I think one of, one of the two for Kay is absolutely his writing style. But I think the other thing is just his establishment of the setting, which of course in fantasy we call world building, but yeah. I think it's just, there's such a richness in our bond that I, I just, I loved it. And this is a book that every time I read it, it was just, I'd sit down on my couch and I would just have this feeling of joy before I even opened the book to read a page because I was just so enthralled, so immersed in this story. And I just loved it. And I think the songs, you know, Joanna talking about music, I think there's almost a nostalgia for me thinking back to like freshman year of music school, learning about the troubadours because this is an important era in music history and thinking back where, you know, me as an 18 or 19 year old, where I'm starting the path of what's going to be my life passion. This was something I really loved learning about. So I think part of that is just very personal for me in that connection. But I think even just from, a writing standpoint. I mean, this book's just an absolute home run. I don't have anything negative to say about it. I'm just going to sit here and gush for the hour or whatever. We yes, talk about I love book. what you shared. 
I think that that you brought up so many important points. I feel I relate to you very much in both things that you mentioned. One, the songs. I I am usually team song in fantasy, and I know a lot of people skip them, and they're not as um, interesting to some people. I personally think songs tend to be an important aspect of world building in many books, but in this book, I've never ever read a fantasy book in which the use of song was pertinent to the plot, was pertinent to the motivation of characters, to the storyline in general. And it's not just one type of song. And I love that. And I also just related to what you're saying about music. I also love studying about the troubadours too, as I, you know, reviewed my grout chapter on troubadours to talk about them in a, yep. a history of Western music for the music nerds out there uh, to talk about them in my review. And I just, they were the rock stars of their time. If Taylor Swift were living back then in the Middle Ages, she would have been a troubadour. <laughs> and there were female troubadours too, which was a really cool thing to note. And I think that even though there were maybe some differences here and there, I, I think he got the troubadour thing accurate. And in fact, it was also beautiful because as I mentioned in my review, the troubadours didn't do... They did focus mostly on love as the main theme in their songs, but they wrote different types of love songs and different types it came out in different ways. And they wrote pastoral songs and musical plays and different kinds of songs. And you got that in this story. It wasn't just one type of song. There were different types of songs. And I love the way they affected the characters. But going back to what your second point about setting, 100% agree with that too. I connected with the settings more in this book than the Lions of Alversan as well. As much as I loved the settings, the desert descriptions, the water stream going through the palace, uh, the pillars in the palace, everything there in the Lions of Alversan. In this particular book, we get two contrasting settings. And he has such a way of describing the tone, the stark contrast, the eeriness, um, the fog, the coldness the bleakness of the north in contrast to the groves, the vineyards, the olive trees, the sun, the sunlight, and even historical sites with the arch, all of that in the south. So I felt like there was just so much richness with that contrast. So for me, I personally connected with the settings more in this book. And one more detail I'll give and that's spoiler free about the settings. I love that he puts so much attention into the time of day. I've noticed I like that a lot when an author pays attention to the time of day. And especially when you're in the Middle Ages and you don't have electricity, you don't have light pollution, he pays attention to when the moonlight, and with two moons in this case, are affecting people's vision. And when the clouds obscure the moonlight, how that affects their vision, yep. those little tiny details. To me, th that's incredible world building incredible atmosphere and again just adds to the overall tone in the story i will say for me in terms of the songs for me my favorite song based book is the hobbit <laughs> i love the songs in the hobbit i just i i love them so so much for me i'm not big on romance and love in stories. So I think that I, the music didn't resonate as strongly with me because a lot of it was linked to love. Like it's the court of love type thing. And I still liked it. But I think for me, like I love hearing how much it resonated with you and Josh because you're both very deeply entrenched in music. And I feel like you're the primary target audience to appreciate that, which I think is wonderful. But for me, I appreciated the songs that were descriptors of the seasons and the changes and things like that. Like that for me were my preferred songs in the, in the story. I thought those were the most beautiful. So I, it was interesting to me that there were different iterations of different types of songs and music. And really, if you do get a chance to listen to the audiobook, the way that they are performed is different as well, because the ones about the seasons are much more somber. And the ones of love are usually more upbeat and enigmatic. So it definitely enhances the experience. And if you're in the comments, and you're like, well, I don't have much of like a connection to music, and I don't care about songs, maybe this isn't the book for you. Well, guess what? 
I don't either. And <laughs> if GGK had only written this novel, it would still be in contention for my favorite standalone novel. The only reason it isn't is because he's written other novels. So you're yeah. still good to go, folks. You're still good to go. And it's good that you liked it, Johanna, because I commented once that if she didn't like this book, I'd eat my copy. <laughs> um, at no point was I worried, yeah. but uh, I still am glad that I don't need to eat this copy. <laughs> Of I think that was in our last live stream, right? Didn't yeah, you right. That? I yep. mentioned it. Yeah, um, and we are <laughs> confirmed. Uh, I was never. I, I was at no point worried, but <laughs> it's good to confirm that that's not happening. Yeah, good. Uh, anything else we want to say? Spoiler free. Do you all want to mention? If you are interested in French historical settings, I'd say this is a good candidate of a book for you. If you are interested in political intrigue being motivated by religion, I would say this is a good book for you. And if you are interested in the dynamics of how religious influence seeps into everyday life and culture, this could be a good book for you. Yeah, you know, that's interesting because you're right that religion is a prominent feature in this story as just to, again, say spoiler free, in the North, the the culture there is very much a patriarchy and they worship a male God, a single male God. And in the South, they, they worship a goddess and the goddess is represented also by the moons, which is interesting because they have different names for the different phases of the moons. Yeah. But, um, and it does seep into the cultures at the same time. I didn't feel like religion felt like it was embedded in the culture that much. Oh, it was it, felt, it was a major theme for me. So that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I saw it there, but like I felt like, for example, well, it's hard to talk about this without. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to pause on that. I didn't feel like it was um, as deeply motivating for what some of the characters did. Yeah, and for the actions in the story, even though it was prominent there, in the like, it felt more in the background to me. But it was there. Uh, and I guess that also speaks to another spoiler-free thing we could say is that the magic again, I mean, I'm just kind of, I don't want to repeat too much of what I said in my review because <laughs> I kind of ta talked a lot about the spoiler-free features there too, but the magic is very, very minimal. Uh, there's psychic magic, which is attributed, attributed to the goddess possibly. And, <laughs> and I don't know, well, we have two moons, but aside from that, I don't know that we have much magic. Yeah, yeah these two good. books have made me realize that I don't necessarily need magic in my fantasy. Yeah. yeah. This it's, has, I think, a little bit more magic than Lions, but it's still, like, pretty minimal. Did you um, think so? I found it to be fairly on par. I mean, I don't want to give away spoilers for Lions, but there's a character in Lions that I felt was reminiscent of the magic that we were experiencing in this world. I agree. Yeah. I mean, they're both pretty low magic. I yes. think, like, the opening chapter one like with the island yeah um and then there's also like a vision scene also like i think sometimes this is more like it's more overtly magical right because the people like on the island i forget their names because i read this book a long time ago and i'm bad at names they kind of like play into and pretend their magic can do more than it does and kind of use like theater um an illusion which like the first time you see it you see it from someone else's perspective right uh, compared to the character in lions it's just like a one family thing and they're just like oh yeah i can do this so they're not like mm -hmm. as flamboyant as, as there, there's no like theater behind it so I, I think it comes across as slightly more but yeah i mean most ggk of the historical books are going to be pretty low magic i think lions is maybe the lowest magic um off the top of my head but they're all in the same like yeah. yeah, general vein, yeah. I actually really like the GGK magic stuff. I sometimes wish he would, like, lean into it more because I think he writes the supernatural stuff, like, really well. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of The Last Light of the Sun, which is the, like, England, Alfred the Gate, great era one that a lot of people like way less, mm -hmm. but I think is brilliant. I will like that England one. Haters. I love that era. <laughs> um, it has, uh, he takes, like, the the forest that was not actually haunted, but people may have thought was haunted. And he's like, it's actually haunted now folks. <laughs> um, and it's probably my, but anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting to hear your take on this. Cause um, I mentioned this in my review. I felt like there were several things. I call them chaosms, 
several things in this book that I saw in parallel to the Lions of Alrazan and the magic was one of them. Um, I had a list of other things too. And so I, I realized he kind of, he likes to use similar devices in his books. It oh, wasn't a there bad There are thing. definitely chaosms. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> chaosms yeah. are a thing. Yeah. They are. It yeah. wasn't a bad thing by any means. I felt like he did a very excellent job with those things. And another thing I could say, spoiler free, is because we brought up the sexy time, like in the first book. Um, as far as the sex scenes are concerned for A Song for Our Bun, I thought that they were actually better. <laughs> like they they were fine in the first book. Um, I liked them, but I felt like they almost were more comic in a way, uh, <laughs> in some ways. And then in this one, it felt like they just felt more natural. That's so funny because I had the opposite reaction while reading. I was like, I wholeheartedly prefer them in Lions. <laughs> really? Because I thought yeah. I thought the ones in Lions were they were good, but they were like really funny. Like I thought they were kind of meant to be Which funny. It's part of why I liked them because it was they're both being utilized in each book to highlight the character of the person and the relationship that that person has, right? So in this story are blaze you can just name him it's not a spoiler he's one of our characters it's interesting kind of seeing the way that he approaches relationships but in lions i loved both dynamics of the married couples that we saw and mm -hmm. i thought that was so interesting because i feel like so often in books it's more of a blaze type situation where it's someone that's unmarried you know they tend to be kind of charming and you know we rarely see married couples shown in a way that like they're intimate and you can be married and still have that aspect to your life. It doesn't just end like this myth that once you get married, that part of you dies. So I actually really preferred it in Lions from that perspective. But I agree. I still thought that it was tastefully and well done in this book. I had no issues with that overall but yeah I, I thought it was interesting <laughs> that's a really solid point though about the the difference there um in this book i felt like it was i think part of the challenge is that the society the way it's structured doesn't it's still like like i said in my review um so this isn't a spoiler but the south even though it's much more it's considered woman ruled only because at this point, the count has passed away and the countess is kind of the main authority figure in the land. But for the most part, there's still a patriarchy. There's still a court system in place um, and women are to marry certain men or that there's kind of like an arrangement of marriage, especially among noble born. So there was, I mean, maybe some infidelity <laughs> as far as that's concerned. Um, and then also just instances of people not being married and just hooking up. <laughs> so yeah. uh, anyway, yeah. anything else that you guys want to say? Jake and Josh are very silent here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hope it's not an awkward topic. I don't know. There's a few things I want to bring up, but I think they're more in the spoiler section. I know so. it's so awkward to not talk about spoilers. <laughs> I'm so bad at it. <laughs> it's like there are things you can talk about in spoiler free, but I feel like we're going to talk about them in spoilers and talk about them yeah. for spoilers. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I got a correction here small correction it is the same religion okay because yeah like hmm. our bone also worships the god that gorehau worships just they also have rian as well rian, yeah. but gorehau's like no nah, rian heresy oh okay my Thank understanding is that they kind of view them as the yin and the yang in south and in the north it's like no there's a clear hierarchy where oh, that man. makes a lot of sense so, well, that actually makes yeah. it, that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, fantastic. So let's go ahead and go into spoilers. If I could figure out how to put on spoilers in the thing. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, here we go. I just have spoilers. Oh, look spoilers. at that. Here we go. It's like a new <laughs> thing. Well done, you. Hold on. <laughs> Let me get rid of that part because we're not really, <laughs> it's a standalone. Yeah, All right, I'm still trying to figure out how to use streamer on the banner side of things. <laughs> All right, so we're in spoilers. What do you want to say? We'll start with Josh. Uh, so I want to bring up just one aspect of the songs and see if everybody was as moved as I was. There's about around the halfway point 
there's a scene where kind of an aging troubadour, I don't remember his name because he was only in like one scene and he came in and he sang this song, which was, it wasn't about love. It was more about the history of the world. And it brought me to tears. Mm. And I just wonder if everybody else had the same similar feeling with this one scene. His name was, begin with a K. Mm -hmm. I don't remember his name, but he was only in this one scene. And that's when I just, it just struck me just how good this author is, that he can have this character who's a nobody. And we, I think we're watching it from Lesoit's view. Yes. And we're seeing this kind of older legendary troubadour go up and he takes his time to tune his tune his guitar or whatever and then he starts to sing and he tells this story and it just I had tears in my eyes it was just so beautifully done and I just I want all of your thoughts on that scene whether it was like I was by myself on this or not but that's a scene that's just indelible in my mind with this book I loved it I honestly I loved that scene too um She's such an interesting character, right? Because she's involved with all of these people, but isn't our, she's like our eyes for so many of these different characters and behind the scenes things. And in that moment, it's interesting because I feel like you get to see the history of the troubadours in one scene where we have the young with her, we have, you know, her mentor that she's working with. And then we have a guy that's been around and experienced and he comes in and he just floors everybody and leaves like he doesn't even care about this like contest that they're doing he's just like all right i'm out bye and the song itself was great i loved it it was one of this that was one of the songs that i really liked because it wasn't really about love it was more somber and almost educational <laughs> um but the the audiobook for that song was really, really lovely. So yeah, I highly enjoyed that scene. I thought it was excellent. <laughs> yeah. I think I teared up on almost every song. <laughs> so <laughs> but yeah, no, that's a really good point. I yeah, going back Someone to the in the comments remembered his name. It was Ramir. Ramir. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank he did you. the full credit song. He sang the song for our bone. Um yeah. I'm gonna let Josh down because unfortunately I, I did. I was like, that's a good scene. Um, it didn't quite emotionally resonate with me in the same way. I really like not the actual song, but like the part after, because he comes in and it's like supposed to be a love song. And then he sings a song about our bone. And he's like, yeah. never mind. I did sing a love song. I, yeah. I like that after. Um, well, the yeah. thing is, the songs weren't all about courtly love. They were yeah. about a different kinds of love. And sometimes, and so we're stretching the idea of what love is about. And I think that also comes full circle into the end with Bertrand, because you see, it feels like Bertrand's story is all about Elise, his love that he lost 23 years ago. And you want to know what's what's motivating him now. And at the end, it's his love for our bun. It's his love for, for his land. Um, that's what the love is about. So it feels like it's a transcendent love, a love that doesn't negate romantic love, like the intimate love with another person, but a love that kind of expands further than that. And so I felt like that was what those kinds of songs were about too, including, and I want to also mention a song I loved. And that was one of the first songs that was maybe the first song. I'm not sure. The song where Bertrand sings about Gorho and he sings about the, um, about basically the, the cowardice <laughs> of Gorho's uh, king with the, with their fight in the North. And he asks Blaze, you know, he says you know, about his piece. He's like, it's not my piece. And he's like, that's what I was hoping for. So I thought that was powerful because I feel like Blaze is a lot like Laura. <laughs> and he doesn't give a damn about courtly love and that in those songs. He's like, ugh, rolling his eyes at that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then and then Bertrand sings a song that's not about that, but is about something that is moving to Blaze. That's about yeah. his land, about honor that was not uh, honor at the end of the day and uh just seeing his response to it i could feel blaze shift in that moment and it just yeah. oh it was such a striking powerful scene so i honestly i and i do resonate with blaze for multiple levels in that scene because <laughs> the fact you. that it isn't about courtly love which is great and then secondly I'm someone that's left their homeland. Like I don't live in my country of origin and I lived there for, you know, the first 27 years of my life and I don't live there anymore. And I think very differently about my home now that I'm not there when as compared to when I did live there. And 
when people speak of it, I feel very emotional over the fact that I no longer live there. It resonates and it pulls at my heartstrings. And I felt that with Blaze so much throughout the book. Like that for me was one of the more compelling aspects to the whole, the whole story is just how much you want to preserve your home and your honor and your tradition and all that stuff. So I, I really liked that part. That's interesting you say that because I think there was a line at the beginning where Blaze says that he doesn't feel a connection to his home. He feels yeah. more connections to people, mm -hmm. uh, but homesickness can be applied to people. So yeah. I think that changes as this well, I think it's twofold, right? I think I think it's almost that he's telling himself he doesn't miss home because of the relations that he still has there. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I was like, okay, he's looking back upon his childhood beatings and the relationship with his father and the tumultuous way in which he left. If you're leaving in a state like that too, you might also not be homesick because if you don't have someone to really want to go back to, I think it's different. Um, but when you have family there that can that you're connected to and close to, that can definitely change things. But his his person really changes throughout this whole story, right? Like we have, of course, all these other characters, but for me, Blaze is really the main protagonist of our story. And you see him go on quite a monumental journey with how he feels about himself, about others, and about the two regions. It's very interesting. And the religions. Like, honestly, everything is kind of touched upon by Blaze's character. Yeah. Does anybody remember the exact timeline of this book? Like, I know we're going through the seasons. We start midsummer, right? Or is it spring? And then go to... It ends, it ends in winter because that's the battle. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. So we're not there. It starts spring. in spring, midsummer, autumn, and winter. I have okay. the uh, okay. ebook up right yeah. now. So it's not quite a year, but I feel like we see Blaze really transform as a character. And I was chuckling out loud at the beginning of the book, just to like, just with the subtext of his internal dialogue or his internal thoughts. Like you can almost imagine him like rolling his eyes at these like troubadours, these frivolous troubadours. And they're not even singing about maidens. They're not even singing about single women. They're singing about married women. And this whole entire thing is just so ridiculous. <laughs> and he thinks the, you know, the culture is so different for him. And it's like, he's not really interested in learning from it. He's not really learning. He's not interested in asking questions. And I think like one of the, mm, I think it's Bertrand's cousin who approaches him at one point and says, I didn't even think you cared because you haven't asked any questions about what yeah. we're doing and our it's traditions. One of my favorite like bits of dialogue in the book is that conversation where she's like, you know, most people like leave home to explore the outer world, but you don't seem to like, you know, want to learn anything. And Blaze, the, the direct line is a different sort of elbow in the ribs. Some men leave home to leave home. Yeah. Um, and I love that line. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Blaze kind of, he has kind of given up on his home. Cause he's just at, at the start of the book, he's accepted that it's never going to be a major part of his life again. Yeah. And then the kind of like the opportunity and like the hope restrikes and he realizes that he will have an opportunity later um, for the, you know, second part of his life. Oh, well said. Yeah. And I mean, at the beginning he is kind of, he, well, he pretty much throughout the book is the reluctant leader yeah. type of character. But at the beginning, I mean, he's, he does not have his eye on the throne, at least according to him. <laughs> There's that theme, that powerful, also that powerful discussion there. Um, he really goes through a lot of changes, though. And I feel like you see little instances where we break through. One, when he's on the island and he gets that psychic vision, which is outside of his, uh, his paradigm of seeing things. And then the second one, maybe with the song that he hears from Bertrand. And then maybe another one is... With Liso, I think his interaction with Liso softens him a bit. Uh, I feel like we see, he, he almost looks at her like a kid's sister and she has, she's infatuated with him. It's so much like Alvar and Jahan from yeah. <laughs> Lions of Alrazan, just yeah. gender yeah, flipped. You definitely, I mean, I, I love that part of when I watch your review, bringing up a lot of those parallels. Cause I did, I did love some of those story beats. And then even kind of like the bromance between Blaze and Bertrand was a lot like, you know, what we saw in Lions of Orison. And 
I mean, if if it works, use it. <laughs> I mean, if it's a Kism, fine. I'm I'm here for it. Yeah, I like the Kisms. It is funny. Like sometimes you'll read something and it's like, K, you're the only person who would write that. It was great, <laughs> but you're the only person like I could read that not knowing who it was and be like, that's a Guy Gabriel K character. Although it was funny because mm -hmm. I remember once there was someone from history who someone shared the Wikipedia article. I think it was like Three Kingdoms there. I think it was Kyle. And I was like, that's a Guy Gavril K character, but it was actually a real person who he hasn't written about yet. So get on it, K. <laughs> oh, how funny. Um, it was like a poet general. And I was like, that sounds familiar. <laughs> um, I've, read, I've read that before. <laughs> I will say, though, in terms of characters not overlapping, this book was infuriating in the way that women are so regularly treated. Like I had a really hard time in certain instances in this book where I was like, like wanting to just jump through the page and like attack these men. Cause I was like, guys get it together. Like, come on. It was so frustrating. Like you have so many wonderful female voices in this story and there's a few moments of complete agency for them. And a lot of the time I felt like that ended up being through our sexual relationships that they kind of sought that agency. And I was like, that's fine. Like, do you pick who you want to be with? But the thing that, and this kind of gets back to the religion thing that I was saying earlier, it's so fascinating to me because if you look at the actual history of ancient religions where we have a husband, wife at the top of our godhead, it almost always ended up that the female was erased or that she was deemed lesser. Like there's no real instance where they are fully equalized. The closest that we got was Isis and Osiris in Egypt, but then it became over time that you needed Isis to get to Osiris. So this for me at the end of this book was so validating that the side, I'm saying side quite loosely, that adhered more to having them equal is the side that was victorious. And they thought it was because of the boons that the goddess had given them. I was like, I'm here for this. Like, I'm so here for this. I loved it. I loved it so much. <laughs> ah, that's fantastic. That's cool historical detail. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, like I, I've been, I went to Greece a few years ago and I mean, like everyone kind of thinks of Zeus as being this philanderer nut job, which in the stories he is. But his wife was way more important before he was. But no one talks about that. Like she had all of these temples that we know belong to her and they've been rededicated to male deities. And that kind of has happened globally with all of our pairings. So this to me was so fascinating reading it from a religious lens and going, we have this hyper patriarchal society here and they burn priestesses. They're very anti-woman in terms of leadership, in terms of religious leadership as well. And then we have the opposing faction, if you will, that is very equal and leans more, in fact, into matriarchal society. And it was just so interesting to kind of see that division and how each side approached similar situations. So yeah, I, I really, really appreciated that part. I think that's something that he does very well because I also appreciated the religious aspects very much in Lions. So I'm curious to see going forward in other books if I'm as into the religions that he's established, but my hopes are high. <laughs> yeah, he's really good at writing characters that are influenced by the religions from which they're from. But at the same time, it never feels like they wear their religion on their sleeve. Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel that way in this. Book. No, I, there was one line that Blaze had later in the story. And I'm basically paraphrasing where he was saying that when he came to Arbon, the ways of the goddess were kind of like lost on him. And he thought that they were kind of frivolous. But by the end of the story, he realizes that Arbon might actually have have the correct view of things. And I thought that was so interesting too, because it just added to this whole arc of his and really coming around into his own. And it, it shows, right, when people do leave home and are exposed to new cultures and experiences, their eyes can be open to things, but they can still retain aspects of who they are. You just grow as a person. So yeah, there was a I, lot. Of I kind of felt like that was sort of a, a major 
theme, overarching theme in this story is that by elevating women, you are not diminishing masculinity. You are actually complementing masculinity um, Mm -hmm. by acknowledging women, by, you know, by having a a sort of equality, even though they're different, you know? So I felt like that was the main thing. I think for like Blaze's art, for how he kind of starts kind of ignorant, I think a huge one part that resonated with me about the story was that his kind of thinking lesser of that was just because he had no experience of that kind of culture. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's the, there's the, uh, I mean, Blaze is uh, overtly like homophobic, right? Like he's like, Oh, um, I think I forget the character's name. I read this too long ago, but it's the Duke who ends up being like the MVP in the final battle. (laughs) And at first he's just like, Oh, this guy, like, that's why you're because um I can't remember anyone's bloody names. I'm gonna just describe people. Is it the um, Ur- Urt de Demiraval? Is that what you're talking about, or is it? Uh, no, it wasn't Urt de Miraval. It was like a. It was a more lesser character. It was what's um. We need a dram with this persona. I know. Yes, I do. <laughs> Didn't he know that we would have this? Talk? I, and I've forgotten some names too, unfortunately. There's so many. Okay, I think. It, uh, um. It's not Ali- oh, Ari- oh, it's Ariane's um, husband. Ariane's husband. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Who Ariane's mm-hmm. kind of like cheating on her husband with Blaze. Yes. Um, <laughs> and Blaze is like, oh, you must like hate him. And she's just like, well, no, he's just, this is kind of, this is what we do. Like we were forced into the marriage politically. So like, why would we honor that contract? Like yep. he's, he's a good dude though. Um, and as Blaze is more exposed to these things that he wasn't familiar with, it becomes harder to be like it becomes harder to hate something once you like understand it usually once you truly understand something like it's just it's yeah there we go there we go thank you ryan mm-hmm. thank <laughs> you. ryan remembers people's names Taranzu, yes it's so interesting too though because in the beginning of the story when you're introduced to Singna, we she's talking about the new love songs in court and how arranged marriages aren't aren't loving marriages and so on and so forth. And she's lamenting the loss of her husband saying we would have proven them wrong. And it's so interesting that you're given the perspective of someone that was in an arranged marriage and had a wonderful marriage and loved her spouse very dearly to then kind of contrast that with Ariane, who's like, we were forced into this situation. It's not ideally what we wanted, but we make it work and it works. Well, well for he us. wanted it. He wanted it. Yeah. yeah. He I think yeah. the most common representations of like arranged marriage are either look, it works out, love story, or they hate each other. And what I really like about Ariane and uh, Theory is they like respect each other. They yeah. like each other, but they're just like, but we're not actually going to act like we're married. We're just yeah. like kind of friends, I guess. <laughs> who the law says we're married. And I, I thought it was, I like that Kay, I think one of the things I really like about him is he has a very like wide, he shows a very wide view of humanity, like of a situation. He's not going to be like, this always goes this way. Yes. And this is another example of that. It seems like there were just a lot of mismatches with marriages throughout the book. I mean, <laughs> thinking about Rosala and her husband, <laughs> yeah. uh, Blaze's brother. And then I felt I really wanted to see something with Roban. And uh, so Roban is the chancellor of Arban. And he has this 40-year-long crush on Sinya. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, I kind of want them to get together or him to present her with the rose or whatever tradition but i never got to see that and then the character who's dear to my heart is luf the real mvp of this book <laughs> um, uh, I oh loved i loved him yes yeah luf is the best can i ask i'm jumping ahead a little bit here but how did you feel about our ending to this story because it's do you feel it's a happy ending? I guess is more my question to you. Do you feel like it is a happy ending? It's happier than the lights of our song. It is. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, I would probably describe it as on the happier half of bittersweet. Okay. Um, Which it's probably, I hope you guys are enjoying the relative happy to half of bittersweet. Cause I think <laughs> t- 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 tends to live more on the bitter half of bittersweet um, more often than not. Anyway, I've I've always found the best works, the ones that move me the most are the ones that have a touch of both at the end. 
-hmm. If it's all too happy and it's tied off with a bow, it's okay. That's nice. It, you feel good about it, but then you never think about it. And these ones where there's a lot of happiness, but there's elements of, you know, what could have been or what should have been. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that stick with me a lot more. That's fair. How about you, Donna? I, what, well, I mean, which part of the ending? Like, because there was a little afterwards, so, there was Renette's story. I was going to say, do we feel like the postscript, basically, like, would you have been fine without hearing what happens? Basically, that Blaze gets married twice. Like, this is kind of what happens in our world. Like, we don't know who he gets married no, to. No, we don't. No, so that's that's why I'm asking. Is I it one of those do. things that you're like, I'm good not knowing and assuming that maybe he marries, you know, the secret daughter and then maybe marries Ariane later. Or is it like, are you content not knowing? Also, it's ambiguous. I, so, this is, I would describe as another, like, this is, it's such a K ending to just like throw in the ending. Like, yeah. And then like his second wife and it's like, okay, did this first wife die? Did they just yeah. get divorced? What's going on? Um, but yeah, I liked it. I am team oh. open ending. I feel like I differ from a lot of readers in that way. Um, I don't feel like I need everything tied up in a neat little bow. Mm -hmm. And so like the fact that there was room to wonder and be curious about, and it still seems like they had interesting lives, you know, like that was exciting for me. I, I thought yeah. it was great. I loved it. And I also I loved uh, just before the post postscript part, I really liked the Renette, who's basically the person on the cover here. Renette, um, her storyline, like she's secret error. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I okay. <laughs> the so two you like things... the ending that the you character got because you're the yeah. I like me. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, mm -hmm. the two big things at the end I thought were both really well done. The conversation that Blaze, his final conversation with his father was for me probably my highlight of the book. Like I loved mm, that conversation. Yeah. Do you think was he was like, lying? His dad. Sorry. How full he, do you, how much do you trust his dad? Like do you think he was lying or I think he was honest. I, is, I do too. You really? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think he was honest. I think he was partial. I think there was a thread of truth. And I think this is something that he thought might be a possibility. Yeah. I think he was acting like it was his first choice. I think in reality it was probably more like his, his third or fourth fourth choice. Yeah. But he was like not completely dissatisfied with the result. Yeah. And it was one he saw coming. Even I agree with that. Like, he was all like, this was my plan all along. And I'm like, I feel like you had a couple other choices before. Yeah, he, he, he so definitely exaggerated it. But I, I don't think anything he tell said was maybe totally untruthful, but maybe just he painted it in a positive light to make himself look good at the end. Yeah. He block. I didn't lie. I exaggerated. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I loved that whole scene though. And it was similar to the scene that he had had earlier with uh blaze's brother, Renault, I believe was his name. So I, I liked that that thematically kind of came back that the dad was like, I'm puppet master to everybody here. And like I'm dropping this truth bomb before I die. Like I loved that. I thought it was so good. And the twin thing too, I was like, coming out of left field and I'm here for it. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. So I want to say a couple of, well, for one, I really loved, um, even though as much as I love Jahane, Jahane, Jahan, however you say her name in Lions of Albertson, <laughs> I still want to know because we'll talk about that another time. That's another conversation, but I have like so many <laughs> questions about how to pronounce her name. Um, but when it comes to this book, uh, I really loved Lisso. I love that character. She was the innocent. She was the Alvar in the story. She was, like Laura said, the character that he used to show background, the background, the troubadour culture, so many aspects in a very similar way that Alvar was in Lions of Ours on. But I also really loved Rosala. And I want to talk with you guys about that character. And yeah. I think her her character um reframes perceptions of blaze because when we get the initial story that he sleeps with his brother's wife just to get vengeance on his brother yeah blaze just sounds like a jerk i mean i won't cuss on my channel but <laughs> let's see what i really think of him but i was i was pretty like i was not pleased when i read that part about him and then later on we get different context we understand her part in that and we understand 
and the way that, oh man, this was an, a, a scene that also moved me to tears. There were several. I got really emotional in this book, uh, but I got moved to tears when he, uh, when he, he basically does that gesture to Rosala. He gets on his knees. She's about to get on her knees and acknowledge him as royalty. And he beats her to it. He gets on his knees first. And it just, it was kind of funny. And it was just so bittersweet too. And he presents her, I think, with, was it with the rose? Yeah. I don't remember he presents her with the white rose. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, you're, right, you're right about how our perception of that character changed. Because it was almost like, you know, he, Blaze slept with her to get back with the brother. But also it seemed like, it almost seemed like it was a non- events and at least the way blaze i think we were getting it from his point of view mm -hmm. and then when we see her and we see the brother we see things very different and then when we finally see rosala and blaze together it's it's changed even again so i did like that character because it was she was a character that really didn't come into the book until i don't know about midway at least yeah and um became so much more important than i thought she was going to be i thought she was just going to be a really minor thing even when she fled I thought that would be the end of her story. So I was, I was kind of surprised to see her character become as important as she, as she did. She and was my favorite character. Um, uh, first and foremost, any woman who is like full term to get on a horse and flee, like I can only imagine because I was a <laughs> land whale by that point and could barely make it down my driveway. So um, reading that I was like, I love her already. It's fantastic. But the scene in which she decides to put her life on the line and bust into the room because she sees an assassin going in, I was like, I love her. She's so great. And I also liked the fact that through her, Kay was kind of playing with conventions of motherhood. And there's even a line where she says something along the lines of like, Mothers weren't supposed to care about checking on their babies regularly, but she kept going in to check on her son. And I was like, that is so human and so relatable. And it's just those endearing traits that I I loved her so much. And I this is kind of the agency thing that I was talking about earlier with when we get that reframe of how we see that they came together, you realize that it's really more so from her initiating it rather than Blaze. So there were so many things to like about her character. And I really liked the final scene between her and Renelle. I thought that that was a, a really well done scene. I just love her. She's my favorite character. <laughs> oh, I loved her character too. But that whole entire exchange when Blaze meets his son for the first time and he goes down on his knees to her, they go down on their knees to each other. And she's devastated at this point. Because she feels responsible for all of the rape and murder that happened. And Bertrand, as out of respect, doesn't sugarcoat that for her. He tells her exactly how it was. And then you also see the emotions that start to come up for Bertrand. And I loved Bertrand's character. Am I saying it right? Same. Bertrand. Bertrand. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Josh. No, no, same. I really liked his character. Um, I thought he was a good, it was almost like a... So the troubadours historically, you know, they always sang about unrequited love was one of their big themes. And it almost seemed like him because he did lose his love 23 years ago. You know, you saw that side of him and I, I love the complexity. He was kind of the, you know, the warrior poet. And uh, I guess we've seen that character before as well with, with lines of our song, but I don't know. I just loved, I just love the character. There was just so much depth. I thought, with him and we kept seeing it more and more through both his POVs, but also through everybody else, just seeing him and talking about him, like hearing the younger characters talk about him. And yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, Blaze is the main character, but I think in many ways, Bertrand was maybe equally as important in this story. Mm -hmm. One thing like this is a consistent feeling I get at the ending of a lot of case books is like, every character feels like if you think about it in a certain way, they might be the most important. Like mm -hmm. Rosala feels like she could be the protagonist. There's more words about other people. So she's not, but like her story, it feels like she could be Bertrand feels like he could be. Everyone feels like they could be the protagonist. Um, mm -hmm. And it, something even maybe specifically for this book where there is a clear protect, like Blaine, wow, just that like, is... page count, Amazing. just 
is right. the protagonist, but it's just a feeling that I get at the end of most of Kay's books that I love so much in terms of giving every character they do. Like Renald, Blaze's brother, he seemed like a nothing character. Like, oh, so uh, he good. thought he was an afterthought. And yeah. then, okay. like, there was just Adamar just like messed up, and Renald was just like, okay, like, this has just gone a little bit too far. We're let's let's do this. Him um, pledging at the very end, that scene, oh my gosh, it was so good. It felt so epic in scale. And you're sitting there exactly. You think like he's just this drunk buffoon that's really offered nothing <laughs> to the story. Yeah. And that whole last arc with him is just so well done. But I completely agree with what you're saying, Jake, because each character. I feel especially in this story, their arc actively moves the plot forward and then connects it all together, which is something that also felt reminiscent in Lions. Like each person, even though they're part of the whole, they each are pushing it forward in their own weird way. And without one of those pieces, the story kind of falls apart. So that, it's interesting. That is brilliant. Even with Ariane, like when you yeah. find out that after like what happens after the prologue 23 years earlier and she gets her her niece and after her nephew dies gets her niece and runs away and tries to like get away in the rain like that whole entire storyline and how that ties into everything that happens at the end it's so it's brilliant like how oh that's such a good insight Jake like the only other author I could think of who does something maybe similar is Robin Hobb and I've only read you know, the Farseer trilogy, I feel like she does a really good job of doing that too, but in first person narration, um, in that story, in that trilogy. But wow, that's a really, really good answer. Ah, uh, you know, I've had 15 of these to read, so I've had I've had time to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you agree, though, that it's kind of similar to Hob in that regard, or...? Uh, yeah, I think probably, like, I think the Hob character's on their own, like in terms of pure characterization, I think Hobb is a better character writer because I think Hobb's a better character writer than everyone. So default. Yeah, probably true. <laughs> um, yeah. I think Kay is the way the characters fit together. Like he just gives all of them the respect they deserve to be like, to have their story told. So kind of comparable. Mm. I, I, I feel like it's kind of a different thing going on where Hobb, even the characters who are like super minor, it's like, I believe that's a person. K is more focused on the, not necessarily like, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, no, that's Hard really well said. I mean, it just feels like, uh, cause yeah, in this book, I feel like all the characters, the chemistry between the characters, I think is what speaks out to me too. In a K book, speaking to your point and the way I that he Laura builds the chemistry. Mm, go ahead. Laura, I thought Laura made a good point about how the characters all, kind of push the story forward. And I felt that in this one, I thought it was a little better done than, than Lions, even though it was done similarly. And again, I'm talking about two books I love, but I felt <laughs> sometimes in Lions with the plotting, sometimes when we jumped to minor characters, I got a little annoyed because I wanted to be with some of the other characters. I never felt that with this one. I felt like every time we moved to a minor character, I was just totally enthralled with what was going on. And it it always felt important going forward. And I don't know, along those lines, the other thing that I've liked about all three of these books that I've read of K so far is that when I start the book, I generally don't know where the story's going. And I always find it so interesting, just that process of discovery, uh, probably most so in Under Heaven out of the three, to be honest. But I think with, with even all three of these, you meet Blaze and you know he's from a different place, but you don't know where the story's going. And I just, I just love that aspect of all of these books because it's not, there's no formula unless there's the K formula, <laughs> you know, there's no, like, this isn't the typical fantasy quest or the typical fantasy, political fantasy that you see unfold. It just, it goes where it logically has to go. And I just, I really enjoy it. Oh, that's so well said. That's like so well Kay's said. the author who I just reading them. I like Arbon is a very like neat, story like there's almost there's very little fat um it feels like it would have to be planned out to be that neat so yeah. i for a while i just assumed that ggk was like an architect plotter because of like how well things fit together he doesn't outline at all he just like 
writes a scene and it's like, I wonder what happens next and writes the other scene and then just makes it work. And it, it honestly- feels that way though. Yeah. But, no, uh, it's know. really, it's beautiful the way he does it because it's like, like we said, he certainly has his chaosms and, yeah. and at the same time, like there were certain beats to the story, certain climactic moments, but there's still always something, even with Lions of Our Song, the same thing feels kind of organic in the way the story unfolds. And I think that kind of leads to that sense of, of discovery that you're talking about, Josh. Like, I don't know what I'm in for, but we'll see where it goes. And it just unfolds and it's beautiful the way it unfolds. Like, I, I just always find it beautiful. Um, I think one other thing I would say too about the characters is I, I know I mentioned this in um, my last video and it was something that Laura and I talked about in that finally fall tag is just, you know, there's that whole found family trope and that we love in fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Guy Gabriel K does such a good job of showing the possibility of forming friendships in adulthood. Whereas a lot of fantasy authors focus on that, those friendships happening in the formative years when so people true. are coming of age. And it's just beautiful to see people become friends and even romantic interest. That's another thing I love in this book too. And I think that's also why I didn't personally mind. I thought I personally liked the, the the love scenes between, or the sex scenes basically between Ariane and uh, and Blaze. For one, I thought some of the descriptions were beautiful, <laughs> honestly, in those scenes. But I also really loved it because, I guess, just as a female fantasy reader, and I know that you know I'm usually not somebody who typically gravitates towards romance all the time. I don't mind a subplot now and then. But in this book, I really appreciated too that it's not just the women don't have to be young. That woman is what? She's probably in her 30s or 40s. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, it's 23 years later after she's a teenager. So and she was know, 13 when she uh when she took the baby. She said she was 13. So, ah, so yeah, so she's 36. Basically. 36, yeah. Yeah. And then same thing with Sinya. I mean, Sinya being ad admired by Robin for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So it just Seeing that a woman can still have a certain dignity, a certain beauty, and appeal in yep. her later years. Is that's how something I, I live for in fantasy. I, me too. And that's what I was saying in terms of Lions. Like, I felt that way about Miranda when we read Lions. I was like, I love how we're describing an older woman and the fact that he still desires her, still loves her. Like, I think he hits those notes really, really well. But there were a couple of lines I highlighted that I really wanted to just mention because I thought that they were so well said. Um, in chapter two, when Sinya is thinking of her daughter, it says, and memory wounded is at least as often as it healed, which I thought was so beautiful. And later in the story, there was – just pulling it up here. Um, when Blaze's father is about to be killed, he says, behind him, he heard Riddell's voice asking a question. And Terry responded very clearly. Then he heard an order spoken and he heard the arrows sing. I thought that was so beautiful, bringing it once again back to song, even though we're basically animating this object that's being used to kill his father. It's always back to song. I thought that that was just a really, really nice touch that he threw in there. And my last one, uh, and again, it was early in the story, it was what Bertrand de Teller gave them instead in a Highland Hall at the very beginning of that summer amid candles and jewels and silk and gold with early lavender for fragrance and bowls along the tables was war. I was like, it's amazing that he has this really flowery, beautiful language war. <laughs> you know? I was like, it's just, he's so good with his words. He's so, so good. Yeah. I really loved, um, specifically too, when Blaze and, um, I think it's Riddell and company go to go up North to Gorho. And, uh, when they're confronting them at the castle scene, the whole castle scene there with his brother, like there was just such gorgeous atmospheric description there that was eerie it felt haunting it felt ghostly um and it says and i wrote down this one quote here i'm probably gonna read it poorly i apologize because i had it's in my handwriting so <laughs> i have a hard time reading my handwriting sometimes and it was in that stillness as if it were a part of such a dreaming 
that Thaun, I guess that's the name of the character's perspective we're in, then heard the rumble of hoofbeats to the east, a great many, as if the horsemen of the night ride were come down among them from the sky, from the train of the god to ride over the fog shrouded earth and destroy. It's just like, ah, oh, what a great sense of dark, bleak tone and an ominous feeling in the air. I loved it. And you can hear it. It's one of those mm-hmm. things that like you can you can just hear what he's talking about. Yeah, he's so good with descriptors, honestly. He's so, so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love that you said that too because I tend to be somebody, I've noticed that as much as I visualize what I read, I also like, audit- I'm like an auditory reader too. Are you all mm-hmm. like that? Like, I think, even yeah, without that, the I think that's one of the reasons I struggle with audiobooks for dialogue because I mm-hmm. hear the dialogue in my head. Same. And like, especially I'll be like, no, you didn't focus on the right word. That wasn't, that wasn't how they said it, (laughs) Um, which obviously neither of us is wrong, but it just part of what makes me enjoy reading dialogue is that like, I play it in my head and my brain will put emphasis on it and people will say things in specific ways. Yeah, um, that's true. I do that too when I'm just reading visually, which in this case, I struggle with song. I think that's one of the reasons I struggle with them because I, I, I never know what rhythm to put them at because I'm. You should, I have. I struggle with loft, lack of f in talent. You should totally <laughs> just listen to the songs of the I audiobook. Might, yeah, just listen um, to the songs. Like because I really so like the good. narrator. Like I've listened to all the. He's samples, very good, and I know like Simon Vance is like lauded. I feel very strongly that the narrator for this and Lions, which is the same person, is the same are, guy. Yeah, I like <laughs> him more than Vance, who I did Tigana as my reread on audio. Um, I felt like he got the style pretty right on as far as I could tell, you know, yeah. like it's, it felt authentic mm-hmm. to that time. Um, beautiful, beautiful melodies. And I think I'll um, reread and listen to the audiobook next year. Do it, do it, do yeah. it. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's pronunciation. I can read our bone a third time. We'll just do yeah. it on audio the third time. <laughs> right. But I, I do get that. It, French is good. Go ahead. I do, Joanna, get, sorry. Oh, I do get that experience though about hearing the dialogue in your head. I do that too. That's why I won't. Li- I refuse to listen to the Song of Ice and Fire um, audiobooks because the voices are so distinct in my head. But I, what I mean by that is that, like, the hoofbeats, like beyond just the narrator yeah. saying it, like hearing you can the hear that. Yeah. Yeah, you can hear exactly. the ambience because you know yes. what it sounds like, and it's just it's filler, but it's filler in such a positive reinforcement, right? Like, yeah, it's so so good. I mean. I feel that way anytime, like if an author is describing like a battle in the rain or it's storming and I'm like, oh, I can hear it. You know, it's not just like swords clashing. It's thunder. You can hear the cracks. Like it's just, it just builds and adds to the whole experience. Yeah. I felt that too in the, in the festival scenes. I kind of mentioned that in my review. Like I just felt like the ambiance of that setting. Way, and festivals. I thought that was also a beautiful contrast to, to the North as well is in the South, like how they would have those annual gatherings mm-hmm. and even the masquerade. By the way, there's a masquerade in Lines of Our Yeah, <laughs> masquerades, chaosm. Chaosm. It yeah. is yeah. like a day of celebration where like there's a festival or masquerade. It's in like, how many <laughs> I'm sure it's in Tijana, like half of them, I swear. Uh, I think there's one in a bright, yeah, like that's totally a chaism. Yeah, um, I'm here for it, Poison arrows. Right. I didn't say poison no. in my review to, in case it was a spoiler, oh, I but love poison the arrows. One of my yeah. favorite lines from this book, I don't have the thing directly, um, is, I might have it in my review, on, like on Goodreads, um, is when uh, Blaze tells the person hit by the arrow that like he's going to avenge his death. And he's he says it's like the worst like kind of lie. The guy ended up living, so it ended up working out. But he knew he knew who it was. He knew it was Rudolph. Yeah. He knew he wasn't going to kill him. And it was it was false comfort. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the, I have to say, him. by the way, I was so proud of myself in those early scenes because Kay kept very carefully inserting little hints and I caught each one. Like I caught that that was going to be Rudell. I caught the black and white tights. I was like, cause I remember my eyes read, read over that paragraph and I'm like, wait a minute, black and white tights. That's interesting. What an interesting description. <laughs> and then later on that ended up um, coinciding with the arrow and how Blaze knew it was Rudell. I like the part where Rudell demands to be paid the same as Blaze when Blaze isn't getting paid I at know. all. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually we should talk about this because I feel quite strongly. Kay's funny. Like this book is yeah. funny. Yes. And it's funny. not I, as funny as Lions, in my opinion, but there is very good humor mm-hmm. in it. And I think one of the reasons, like I've on my last reread of this, I think it was when I realized that 
I like it when books are funny, but I don't necessarily like comedic characters. Like I like when mm. normal characters are yes. just funny in the way people are who aren't specifically comedic characters. And also Kay's voice is obviously sometimes cheeky. Like the first time you go over to Luth's perspective in chapter one, um, earlier in the chapter, Blaze is like, they'd all been competent, like with one vivid exception. And it cuts over and to the one vivid exception was having <laughs> the worst night of his life. <laughs> yeah, I loved that that scene, the prologue and the, the first chapter with Blaze were such a fun opening. Um, I really loved that whole scene on the island. It was fun with the juxtaposition of the exactly that. It was like things were going so well until, <laughs> until. and then you flip the scene. I was like, oh, that's clever. Oh, we I should love talk that about the too. prologue actually, because the prologue read very differently on reread. So first Did thing it? I have to mention for the prologue, it highlights the importance of chain mail. Dude should have been wearing his chain mail. Go chain mail. Um, <laughs> but that's not the important part. The second bit is um, getting to the end of the book and learning more about Erte, who was not a good husband. But Alice kind of assumes that Erte just doesn't care about her at all and just sees yeah. her as a trophy. And you kind of learn Erte, he does care about Alice. He just sucks at showing it, as many people do, and could really work on his husbanding. But, like, she has such vehemence, like dislikes him so much because specifically because she thinks he doesn't care about her that like it's just on the reread it's like um, also being that. aware of how much shit this is sorry cursing i forgot um of how much crap this is gonna cause yeah it's like talk things out folks come on <laughs> I, I completely agree and that was such a great reveal at the end of the book right because you have this the, the prologue where she's she's acting out of her own agency and that kind of sets up that whole arc for all of these different salacious scenes where these women are like i'm doing what i want i don't care if i'm married this is what's happening and then at the end of the story you see the the effects of some of those decisions right and like we've seen the effect from her lover for the whole book because he's lived with her death for the last 23 years but to get that perspective from the husband I thought was so interesting because I know people that are terrible at expressing their emotions. It doesn't mean that they don't care at all. They care very deeply. They often just can't find the words to articulate it. And huh. it's very difficult for some people. So it, I very much felt for him in that scene because – I can't imagine being in his perspective of thinking, I loved this person very deeply. I wasn't able to con convey that to them. They left me for someone else and then they died. <laughs> like, you know, it just seems like a very, it is a very tragic turn of events in his mind. And he's lived with being the only person that knew that for the last 20 And like years. the bitterness and the guilt, the bitterness yeah. against the betrayal, but also the guilt that like, if I'd been, like if I'd expressed myself better. Maybe this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the yeah, prologue, I'm like I remember guilt. the reading it the second time, I was like, oh, that read differently. Like, um, I could see that definitely being the case on a reread. Yeah, now that you I think it's, that. I mean, I haven't reread all of them, but I think it's the K prologue that's changed the most on reread. And um, maybe it, Maybe it didn't help him that he wasn't a singer, that he wasn't a trainer. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. He um, did say and, that, yeah. <laughs> and then I have one other question for you because I'm just curious because uh, it hasn't come up. Um, a bunch of perspectives in this book are present tense. Most of it is past tense. I'm assuming that was noticed. Um, what effect do you think it had on the reading experience? Do you have, did you have any, did you pick up like when the scenes were present tense and yeah. when they were past tense? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't notice if there was a specific reason for it, but so there, there were times when I noticed. Oh, there, there is? Yes, there is a specific through line. Yeah. Oh, my, then I, I didn't pick it. up on that. My, under, my interpretation, whether or not that is correct, is that it's part reflective and part live, basically, in that like we're getting the happenings and then we have the reminiscing simultaneously but am i uh, incorrect so, in that? no kind of so um every scene that garsenk is in where like people are kind of he, he's his control over the situation yeah. is present tense and it's just so, like the kind of idea and Kay's kind of said like i don't want to specifically say this is the idea because he was kind of just going for a feeling which 
can have multiple reasons, but the main idea was to highlight like the immediacy that everyone has to be in terms of their decisions. Um, I think you said that in your review tension. and I forgot. Yeah, I probably did, but the you review did, was a yeah. while ago. So that's yeah. okay. It was a long review as well. Yeah. Well, I watched I also it when watched you published it, it but I rewatched oh, yeah. it and I think you did say something along those lines and I didn't think about it. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, no, I like that he plays with stuff like that. That's the thing. He, He's sneaky, <laughs> but like in a not annoying way, you know, it's not one of those like deus machina things where he's like, oh, well, it was kind of there all along. It's intelligent sneakiness in his writing. And I really do appreciate that because it's subtle things like that where it's a quick little change in tense and you're like, maybe I caught it, maybe I didn't. Um, but then it can add a whole new layer to your read. You've got well, that with plot know. points too. Yeah, you've got the man's good at words, agree and the man's like sneaky but in an intelligent way agree. he also agree. did the same thing in this book as he did in lines of our song where we're in one perspective and then suddenly in the same section we switch mm -hmm. we go to yeah he like, does whatever he wants yeah he does whatever he wants <laughs> yeah. and it's good i actually love that though like i am a reader that if people are together in a scene i don't mind getting the same perspectives within the same scene just because like the voices are usually so distinct from each other that I love hearing that internal monologue as to how each character is processing it. And it's something that I really like that Kay does because even in, this was a thing for Lions too, right? Like we would have Rodrigo, Alvar, and Jahane all in a scene. And then we'd kind of get like little internal dialogues as to how each of them was interpreting the other one and then the scene at large. And that happens in this scenario too. And I feel like a lot of the time, though, it's interesting, and this is what we were saying about the Lucette character, that she is kind of that one that pulls the threads all together, and she ends up kind of becoming the main interpreter of how everyone is feeling. In, and she had one line. It was when I think she sang to him, um, to Blaze, and it was so reminiscent of Alva, right? It was that, like, puppy love. But she then realized in that moment, she's like, I'm never going to be that for him and accepted that and moved on, but was still able to offer a really unique perspective on Blaze because it was almost like her perception of him changed as the character was growing, which was really cool to witness too, because it's not only our perceptions of him that are changing, but her perception of him that was changing. So I really like that he does stuff like that too. I think it's so good. Also, oh, as a random for his perception of him, she had the perception that the fainting was the only thing that wasn't planned in the whole affair. And yeah. back to GGK being cheeky. So I don't know if you remember, this is after the duel and like he hands out the roses and then he faints and we're in Lasso's point of view. And she's like, it was probably the only <laughs> bit of the entire affair that wasn't like <laughs> specifically planned and choreographed. And then it goes and it back and it's like, well, actually it was. He was yeah. just like, oh, if you're feeling like really tired, like uh, you could try pretending to faint. That'll be dramatic. Exactly. <laughs> um, that By the way, great. that duel was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. And like, this is where I sometimes say it's unfair how many things Kay's good at because it would be totally, if he wasn't good at action, it'd be like, that's fine. He doesn't have that much. Like, he's, he can write a really good story without being good at action. But he's like, nah, I'm just going to be really good at writing action. Well, the Deal duel with it. Have a badass duel. Right. Like, the scene between Rodrigo and I cannot believe that I'm blanking on Amar his name. Ibn yeah, exactly. At the end of Lions is one of the best fight scenes. That's we should ever probably be careful. We're not spoiling for Lions. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there is a very, he has a good job. He does a very good job at building that tension and making the dialogue just as good in that scene like when he's talking to the guy at the end and says like there's place for you here and is trying to negotiate with him yeah. like I just I thought the whole scene it switches very quickly from action to dialogue and it's done in such a swift way that you're not jarred by it and you're appreciative of both skills it's just very very well done yeah yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, I I was asked here, and I'm sorry, Sean, that I'm barely getting to this now, about if we could talk about the here comes the cavalry moment. So I'm assuming yeah. you're talking about, well, when he says moments, I immediately thought of the part where Utra de Miraval comes into battle, yeah. and it seems like he's going to be fighting for the North, and then he yeah. ends up... <laughs> Witching. Yeah. 
Classic. The and then you realize it was all planned. It was all planned. Yeah. <laughs> Digging yeah. One step back. Cause I was reading and I was like, Oh, you're being so frustrated. And also like Ultra and Bertrand's conflict is such a like drain on our bone. Like it's such a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, and also I love that Urta, he was partially doing it out of loyalty to our bone, but he was mostly doing it. So we could be like, see Bertrand, I was in on the plan and you weren't son. Get wrecked. <laughs> I'm built different. Uh, I had a question for you all, by the way. I, I don't know why this is making me think about it. And Jake, especially since you reread it, I wonder if you can answer it. But I, yeah, anybody, but I reread it the longest ago. So we oh, okay. Well, then anybody can answer, of course. Um, so there was, okay. So the love scene between Ariane and Blaze, the first one, the one where she tells him about what happened 23 years ago, about her cousin. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems like I, I probably have to look up the exact passage. So I'm sorry if this is going to be kind of general, so but it seemed like, analysis, it, so. it seemed like there was, um, it seemed like there was a, in that particular part, we get in her mind and her thoughts and her perspective. And it seemed like there was some kind of plan that she didn't approve of, Like she didn't approve of the plan is what she says. And so it seemed like she was scheming some kind of plan with um, Sinia and maybe with Be with Beatrix, maybe um, to do some. To seem to me like maybe that was set up, like she was supposed to get with Blaze, and that they were trying to get Blaze in on some kind of plan. And so I was expecting some kind of scheme going on, and then I never felt like that happened or transpired. But there was dialogue, or there was not dialogue, but there was um, some internal reflection like that. Fortunately, I don't remember that. Or unless I read it wrong. Which yeah, I didn't either. pick up on that. Yeah. When you look at I it retrospectively, though, do you think, because the plan was, right, for the daughter to succeed Beatrix? So is it maybe in her mind she's thinking, like, she can't? Like, she has to rule one day like that can't be the plan i don't know because that's the only plan I, that comes to well, my mind what i what i wrote at the time because this is when when blaze was even more reluctant to take on the leadership role or to take on the crown i wrote down and i could look up the exact page number because i have that too and maybe i'll do that later but i theorized at the time that maybe this was senia's design to get Blaze to capitalize on his repressed hatred towards his father. Like maybe they were trying to get that out in the open, to get his hatred out in the open, to fuel them, fuel him to be on their side. Like maybe, maybe the they saw Blaze. To set him up, uh, um, maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, that was what I gathered because the idea was that he, he was working for Bertrand, but he made it so clear in the beginning that he was there as a mercenary role, that he was there for hire, and that he wasn't, he wasn't getting, and this, and this did transpire actually, because he wasn't really doing it. He was doing it only out of service and not out of loyalty, not out of a deeper loyalty, heart, heartfelt loyalty. And then we get the reveal later on. He said, actually, I, I haven't been under his uh, patronage for this much time. Ever since right. we were on the road and got attacked, I've been his friend all along. In other words, we find out, oh, wow, he's been their loyal friend all this time. But maybe at the beginning, they were worried that he wasn't going to come through for being on their side because they knew who he, who he was. He didn't know that they knew who he was, but they all knew who he was. Maybe so, you're right. I, yeah, I think I yeah. vaguely, I don't remember the Aryan specifically, but I think there was the plan of all, like they specifically wanted to put Blaze as like the ruler of Gorhau to put him forward. Well, um, when you're looking at the prologue, or not the prologue, excuse me, chapter one, when he's on the island and he's talking to Beatrix, like she very heavily implies that, there's a greater plan in place. Like that's why she's letting him leave. Like she basically implies to him that nothing is without being calculated and approved of on her end. Cause she's, you know, and yeah. he has a greater role to play, which is why she, the man they're exchanging him for is not blaze himself. And that's why she lets blaze. Leave. That's right. She says that we may need your help. She, yeah, he does outright say that she will probably need his help at some point. Yeah. This was all really plotted in an yeah. interesting way. If you look backwards, you look backwards. That's so fascinating. And mm -hmm. I also want to point out one other thing. If you look backwards that I loved in this book, and it's how when the first conversation happens with Bertrand and Blaze about go 
going into his service, Bertrand going into his service, he says, I need someone who knows when not to kill. And that line stuck with me at the end when Blaze is holding Bertrand back from continuing to kill because Bertrand's just going mm-hmm. crazy at a certain point. And I and that stuck back. And, and it was amazing because uh, Guy Gabriel K doesn't bring back that that statement. He doesn't echo it. But the but theme is back. Echoed. It's still echoed. Yeah. Right. Subtly, because not on the news. The, in, yeah. In the duel, that's exactly what happens. That's exactly right? what happens. He doesn't yeah. want to kill him. He says he's not going to kill his father. Um, he makes those very clear decisions. So but yeah, Bert, yeah, because Bertrand just wants to. He just keeps going even after yeah. they have his father. It's like, no man, you could just slow down now. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is so again human. Like when you hear about people's experiences in war and like. They're like, you just go into this blank state where you you kind of lose all sense of what's happening around you. I'm like, that's exactly what he's describing. He's caught up in the moment and doesn't really know how to sever himself from it. And he chose the people around him quite wisely because of that fact. Yeah. I thought it was brilliant. Brilliant plotting in this book. Yeah, he's too he's good at too many things. Shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> yeah. As Jimmy said, this book is very good. <laughs> yeah. He, right. needs to, he needs to agree to be like if you uh, he has to pick at least one of like plotting, character work, prose, setting, theme, or even hell action and just agree bad at one of them. Or even like pretty good at one of them. That would be nice. Yeah. Man mm-hmm. writes good. Yep. I mean, <laughs> we're like, yeah, and that's a true. Writer. That's a good point Mac made because a lot of times, you know, GGK tends to put the big battle like off screen or off the page, as oh, it were. Yeah. We saw that in Lions a lot. You see that in Under Heaven, you yeah. know. Under um, Heaven almost like the most, maybe. Yeah. Um, so it is It is interesting when he does it, he is so good at it. Yeah, he also, like, he has a lot of his main characters, which I find somewhat refreshing. Like, a lot of the main characters in fantasy books uh, primarily solve their problems by being very good at violence. Um, sometimes being clever, but the clever is because they weren't quite good enough at violence to solve the situation. Um, this is one of the GGK books where the main character actually is really good at violence, but there's a lot of GGK books where the protagonist is just like, if you gave him a sword, he'd be like, I don't bloody know what to do with this. Like, <laughs> uh, and I, I just, I really appreciate that. Cause it's, it's just a wider view of humanity. Cause you know, not yeah. everyone in, not everyone is skilled in swordsmanship. <laughs> not everyone solves their problems via stabbing, you know? Yeah. yeah. Really, I mean, so many great moments, so many bittersweet moments, uh, heartbreaking moments, and actually some pretty dark, bleak moments as well. So he yeah, just shows such a range. Of I things. was this was the third Guy Gabriel K book I read. Maybe no, I read Fiona Var before this. This was the sixth or something Guy Gabriel K book I read. Um, and I remember about twelve chapters in, being like, "Oh, this isn't like as dark as Lions or Tiana is." And then people were burned alive, and I was like, "Never mind." Yeah, goodness, yeah. 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 It was heartbreaking. The singer scene. Oh, when the singer I really scene. like uh, I forget his name, like the soldier who left the Garsank after seeing like the there's another he's so good at like random one-off characters and me being yeah. like, yeah, that was really good. I agree. Um yeah, I, I'm not an emotional reader, and there was one scene in Lions that got me, and I didn't like fully cry but was getting teary-eyed in this in the end when Singya realizes that her daughter's daughter is alive and they embrace each other I was like oh my god (laughs) my heartstrings were tugging so hard I was like what a moment it was just and she's realizing that this priestess that she's been training to take her place is her aunt like it's just so many emotions at one time i was like how is this woman functioning right now i would just be a ball of emotions on the floor (laughs) but so well done i loved that whole entire scene because it felt to me like it could almost be the opening of another book or another story and there was such a range of emotions from fear Mm -hmm. and anxiety to wonder and excitement just realizing your whole life is about to transform 
That's so interesting too, because I love a standalone because fantasy, we need more standalones. I think that's what everyone's preaching and we just don't get them. Um, but with Lions, I felt very satisfied at the end of Lions and was like, perfect standalone. I'm great with not having any more context. With this, you're right. I feel like there is so much that could lead into a sequel. It's like, if you wanted to answer those questions, how does Blaze's life go? What are the two marriages? What does her life look like now that she realizes she's this the daughter of this woman? You know, it's so many unanswered questions that could be broached in a very interesting way. But yeah, I hadn't really thought about it. And that. can Luth and Blaze ever be friends? Can they? The real question <laughs> that everyone yeah. wants to know. <laughs> That's so funny. I love, I can picture Luce like kind of smug, happy, like almost like skipping at the end of the book as he's walking away, like <laughs> whistling a tune. Like, uh, I love that as a final scene, as a callback. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, uh, once again, I kind of like the openness to the ending though. I, I think that's my thing. I really like open endings. I like to have a sense of closure, but I also like, to be have a lingering sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. I think that that gives me that suspended feeling I'm always looking for. I always use that word. Yeah, I mean, I love that. Like there's certain things that in certain stories I feel very frustrated if they aren't answered because if it's something that's been built up to you and woven in repeatedly and it's just left hanging there, I'm like, well, that was for nothing. But in this sense, I'm totally fine not knowing who the wives are, you know, I'm like, he leads an interesting life. And that to me is good enough of knowing. I'm like, he was an interesting person and he goes on to continue to have a very interesting life. And that is satisfactory for me as a reader. But I think as long yeah. as books answer the big questions, right. if the little yes. ones are there, it's fine. Cause it does exactly. it, it make you wonder and think about them a lot more after you finish the page rather than mm -hmm. I've read a few books where, the the ending just keeps going on and on and on because they feel like they have to wrap up every little loose end and it just gets mm -hmm. kind of tedious it's kind of nice not knowing and just wondering i 100 percent agree with that yes agreed and he does so much of this like jake was saying off screen that he he trusts his reader which is something that is so nice mm -hmm. because i feel like a lot of the time in fantasy especially and it tends to be more in high magic reads there's a lot of hand holding because of the fact that they kind of keep trying to reinforce what the magic system is for you so you know exactly what's going on. And I don't know if it's because there isn't that aspect of there being a ton of magic in the stories or it's simply that he trusts his readers more, but he lets you have those moments to decide for yourself and he lets those moments be off screen. And I think it ends up being more impactful for I the lasting image. I think he trusts his reader just in general, though, because like yeah. even even and I won't give away a spoiler for this, but even like with when we talked about in our Lions of Alrazan discussion, how I pointed out that there was a connection between the epilogue and chapter one, if you look for yeah. it, you know, and and Jake didn't notice it even after his reading, reread. Sorry, Jake. <laughs> but, okay, but maybe no, you I, trust me too much. Please trust, trust me a lot. <laughs> but I'm but I'm just saying like there were, even here when I was just pointing out that part with Sinia, not Sinia, sorry, with Ariane, like it started to piece together. And I, I didn't piece it together when I first read it. And then now that I'm discussing it with you all, like, oh, now I understand what he did. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wouldn't have realized that. And so it's not so stated. He could have gone out of his way to like have a dialogue exchange over explaining everything, but he doesn't. So I love that. But he does bring those threads back mm -hmm. in subtle ways. So it's beautiful the way he does that. He is very Which does good mean reading. that I sometimes have to see on the internet, like Goodreads, like one star reviews. That's just like, why doesn't this make sense? And I'm like, no, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so maybe he should have trusted some of us less, but that's okay. I approve of how much he trusted people. Some people maybe need, to, sometimes I need to be trusted less. Some authors trust me too. Gene Wolfe trusts me too much. Gene Wolf, uh. trust me less. <laughs> Gene Wolf, I'm like, please help me, man. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny. Yeah. But I think I it's mean... not just that he trusts us to pick up like details. He trusts us to be like aware of complex, like moral complexities. 
Right. Yeah. Like, that's the more important thing. I, I think like, I'm fine yeah. if you want to reinforce details, but you can trust me. Like you don't have to, if something has more complexity, you don't have to like overtly. Well, he's well, a genius with morality. Like he's so good with morality. That's the crux of lions. It's the crux of this in many instances. It's just human nature at its finest and really getting into the ethics of it in a very interesting way. It's so good. Yeah. He doesn't give you the easy answers. But I also think that when when I'm talk when talking about those little echoes and things like that, I don't think you even need to catch them all um, as a first time reader to appreciate what he's giving you. Mm-hmm. So I don't even think it's a matter of like I don't get it. You know, I think it's just like you could appreciate the story and not notice things. It's just little details that if you paid really really careful attention, it's just rewarding to that reader. Or if you're rereading it and then you catch it the second time, it's rewarding in that way. So. I mean, I think it's you're not going to catch every everything on any good book on the first time. That's, like, that's so just true. Not a thing that I think just have to get used to. Like, I mean, you probably like there are some books that you can reread ten times, like, and then read it read an eleventh time and be like, oh, I totally missed that. Like, yeah, like Malazan or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, no, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, even what you were saying about the prologue, like I did not notice that at all. And now I mm-hmm. want to go back and reread the prologue of this book. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that either. It's it's no, very, very true. Like, I hadn't thought about it until I read it again. And then I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. 2024 is the year of rereads for me. Too. Oh, <laughs> this I need to stop with it. To, this year was the year of rereads for me. <laughs> yeah. And I just need to tone it down a bit. But I am like, after looking back at my notes and talking with you all, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just listen to the audio book. I might read you guys talking so highly about the audio book. I'm going to. Yeah. Definitely... And he's the same that. one for Lions. And he did a very good job with Lions as well. And that's the one I'm already thinking about rereading next year. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> like <laughs> you okay. can do it again. I, for months, read one Guy Gavril K book every month until I got to the end of them. And then I just kind of didn't stop. I was like, yeah. well, now I'll just keep rereading them. So right. we'll see if, we'll see which one gets reread for this, like read for the third time first. Um, I ordered so- some for my husband for Christmas. So whichever, I'm going to pick one of those, I assume to be the next the next one I go with. So yeah, but I was going to ask actually, Jake, uh, what would you recommend um, for any of us as mm-hmm. our next guy, Gabriel K. Oh, book? There's now, so I know many good options. Josh read under I, need to look at, I need to look at my, yeah, you I, should all join. Uh, if you get it done by the end of November and then River of Stars in December, you can join in on the fun. Just saying. Um, I wish I could. I just can't read that fast. I can't yeah. even. I have a little um, bit. I have a few. And I have a few reads on my plate. So, so. there's um, a lot of good options that you have. There's only a couple that I wouldn't read next. Um, I, I own really, Tigana. Yeah, Tigana's, That's the only thing. Tigana's another pure standalone. So A Song for Airbone and Tigana are the only two that are like pure standalones. Like they have, they're not in the same. Well, technically, actually, there's a Fiona Var is portal fantasy. And so kind of like there's actually a Fiona Var, a couple of Fiona Var references in Arbone. Um, so you can go, uh, Josh, you can go at some point, read Fiona Var and then do the audiobook for Arbone. And you can be like, there's yeah. a random like poem in there that references like the hall of like Fiona Var, references Fiona Var tapestry. There's a couple other ones, cool. well, I think. Um, Tigana is a great option, obviously. Um, Serentine Mosaic is my personal favorite. Um, it's in the same world as our song. It takes place before it, but was published after it. Doesn't matter which order you read them in. You've all already read our song, so if it did matter, I would have led with that. Um, could read Last Light of the Sun. Last Light of the Sun does have a small scene that I think is improved by having read Serentine. It's not enough to worry about if you specifically want to read Last Light of the Sun, but if you don't specifically want to, you might as well read Serentine first. I think Serentine's better anyway. Serentine's like my favorite guy. Okay. I'm looking at my shelf here to see which ones I've already got. And it's uh, The Last Light of the Sun, The Sailing of Serentum, Lord of Emperors, and Brightness Long Ago. But I've ordered Tigana. I ordered him a song for our button, which now I've read. Um, and then All the Seas of the World, I believe. Yeah, just the All the Seas of the World is one of the only ones I wouldn't do next. All the okay. Seas of the World, I feel somewhat strongly should be read after kind of like last in the world it's in the same connected europe as lions okay. of our song and kind of i think is the most connected okay. um definitely don't read it before a brightness long ago um yeah 
Brightness has some Serentine connections, but I think the connections work either way. Okay. There's two. They're all standalones, right? Like, so yeah. there's there's a lot of ways you could go. Um, Did I freeze kind of by the way? For a split second, but you're back now. Okay, because <laughs> my my like all of my screen went blank for a second. Ooh, <laughs> uh, thank no. you so much, Beard of Darkness book reviews. Yeah, very nice. Been enjoying your channel too, so thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I I have Tagana. I'm nervous about it because I know Jimmy was not high on Tagana. No, he was not. Which was surprising. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll do Tigana, like Joanna next. <laughs> okay. Like and Josh, you're welcome to do if you want yes. to read it with us. I have it on the shelf. I'm ready. Tigana, um, I think, when. relies the most upon investment in the central premise. Like Arbone, I was not super invested in like the songs, but still love the book. Tigana, if you're not invested in like the central premise, which is uh, so the central premise of Tigana. Uh, is that there was a a war at some point on the past in the peninsula of the palm and one of the warlords who Tigana has the most magic who's also like a really powerful sorcerer uh his his son was killed in one of the final battles and he was quite upset about this and he used magic and like destroyed the name the memory of the name of the place that in the battle that killed his son and uh sometimes people read Tigana and are kind of like, do you guys really care about the name this much? Like, whatever. Um, and it has, I think, relies more on buy-in on the concept. Um, but also, sometimes it's people's favorite, because I think if you are really bought into that, then it can be, like, your favorite pretty easily. Um, it has my favorite K antagonist. I think he's the mo he's one of my favorite antagonists in the genre. Um and I, I, I mean, I think it's it's one where, it's the one where I most understand not liking it of the K books that I think are brilliant. Mm -hmm. Like I'm more confused the other way. I'm more confused when people like love Tigana. So I'm like, okay, so they really like K's writing and how he tells stories, and then like don't like our bone or our song or Serentine. I most get it the other way, but I still think it's brilliant. Yeah. Well, I I have... Go ahead, Joanna. Oh no, I was just gonna say it's not just you, Jimmy, because I've heard a lot of other people. Um, it does have his weakest right. main POV, but it has a sec. Its second main POV is brilliant. And no, you don't need to read anything before Serentine. Like you can start with Serentine. Um, it doesn't really like. It's actually first chronologically in the world, and like second publication order. So yeah, you're you're good to go for Serentine. Everyone's good to go for Serentine. Yeah. Read Serentine if you're <laughs> if you're listening to this. I kind of want to read Serentine because I keep yeah. hearing about it. Like that's it's my one favorite. I can... Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Lord of Emperors is is my favorite K book. Um, and I just reread my second favorite K book, and I'm like, Lord of Emperors is def is my favorite non Robin Hobb book of all time. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, Beard of Darkness. Have Have you read any Guy Gabriel K books before? Because I know for Laura and I, we've only read Lines of Alversan and A Song for Arbun. And Which is a strong start. <laughs> very strong start. Yeah. 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 I was I was starting to wonder. I I went and watched uh Bridger's um he did a tier ranking of all of the K books. And I've read three of them and he has four on his S tier, and I've read three of the four. So I'm like, am I yeah, am you I, can uh... read one of the ones that aren't S tier? They're still real. So you've only you've read zero of the ones I have in S tier. So okay. I have I have both ones you've read in, in A tier. I have how uh, can lions not be an S tier? <laughs> because I like brightness and Lord of Emperors more. Okay. Uh, all right. My um, husband did say lions that is, the last of line tier. of Brightness long ago he thought was the best final line of any book he's ever read. So, oh, he, he's read Brightness now? Okay. Yes. Good cho good choice. I think, yeah. you know, honestly, okay, here's my thing. I preferred a song for Arbun more than the Lions of Alrasan. But I still actually think, and maybe this is my bias because I started with the Lions of Alrasan. I think I would recommend the Lions of Alrasan as a first. I think Guy someone Gabriel here K book. should make a video on where to start Guy Gabriel K, where they should <laughs> in detail that. go through the pros and cons. I have an, you, yeah, you should do that. Um, <laughs> you would need so to yes, do that. Sorry, if you YouTube search Jake Bishop, where to start Guy Gabriel K, it is maybe my best constructed video. It's a very good video. Um, there are a lot of good places to start. Uh, the main downside of starting with Tigana is you don't get to be a hipster because everyone starts with Tigana. Um, 
Yeah. It's not a real reason. Um, but yeah, Tigana is a totally <laughs> fine place to start. Um, there's like seven or eight places where I'm like, that's a good place to start. And that would be if I can remember them off the top of my head. Uh, a Brightness Long Ago, uh, maybe The Last Light of the Sun, uh, Tigana, Sailing to Serantium, A Song for a Bone, Under Heaven and the Lines of Our Song. I think it also, ma- not that it matters, but if you have a preference for historical yeah. period or place. That would like be that one of the reasons. heavily influence like, yeah. it. Like if That's you look at point. those which take place in uh, Tang Dynasty China, Byzantine Empire, yeah. medieval France, medieval Spain, Spain, medieval England, and then two based on Renaissance Italy with one being much more historical. If you have a strong preference to one of those settings, yeah, go for it. That's a really good point. That's a really strong point. Um, I, I guess I'm just hesitant, even though A Song for a Bun has been my favorite. I'm just a little bit hesitant because I know how much it personally resonates with me because of the songs. But then really when I hear song. that, uh, when I hear Jake loves it as well, and that Jimmy loves it, that it's his favorite, then it makes me feel more validated about it. But, <laughs> but I can also understand too. I can yeah. understand too. I know that one person who commented on my video said that they just didn't think they wanted to read this book because they're kind of just tired of the gender theme, even though I think he does it in a brilliant way in this book. So I, I can understand to people, but I understand that too, because it has been explored quite a bit in fantasy recently. So if you want to- One also kind of thing that I think our bone is slightly different from most of his works is, I think, oh, I forget his name, Gore, Garsank, um, mm-hmm. is probably like the most straightforwardly evil antagonist of like all he's actually he's in interviews he's the only non-dark lord character who i've heard k refer to as evil like k uses the word evil very 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 sparingly hmm. um and i think he describes garsank as like evil so he, he's probably like the moat which isn't necessarily good or bad it's just a cha- difference in the narrative compared to some of the others yeah for sure because, yeah, when you think back to Lions, I don't know if, I mean, there's bad people that, there's but you. Pretty atrocious things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lions, it's, it's really hard to be like, thing. who's the antagonist of Lions? Like, if you had, it's kind of like. Yeah. Well, there is that one scene at the beginning. Yeah. yeah like, there's some people you're like, that's a really bad person. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's hard to be like, who's like, who's the central antagonist one. of Lions? Yeah, like, there's really, it's a group. So, um, and same for like Serentine. It like there's some people in Serentine who are awful. Um, yeah, Albirco. I think Garcank is pro. Like Albirco, I think is at least motivated by something that isn't inherently malicious, and he's willing to do malicious things to achieve that. I think Garcank's motivations are inherently malicious, and I think that's what I would say differentiates them. I know no one here has read Tigana, so it's, I'm just talking to Max Garfield here. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, say, might still be like, here. I just can't weigh in on this. Um, and I think that would probably be the difference between Garsank and even some of the horrible people from Lions. There might be like, there's kind of a minor person in Serentine. Whatever. Yeah. I want to hear from Josh though. Josh, do you have any input on this as this is now your third or fourth GGK book? This is third. I got, I got River of Stars next month. But um, I don't know. I antagonist wise, I mean, I'm I don't think I'm deep enough in to really <laughs> contribute too much of that. Except we did have a truly vile one in this book, just to bring it back to our bone. But um, yeah, um, I mean, under heaven. I mean, that's that's another book. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's some bad people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's it's not like one. There's not one big bad, and yeah. it's yeah. Got it. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like lions. I mean, lions, you see everybody's perspectives and it's, it's very shades of gray the entire time on, on all sides of it. And you kind of understand each side of it. So it's not like there's a bad side or a good side. It's just, there's a side, you know? Yeah. I don't mean to be defending El Pier, El Barico, Matt. Anyway. Uh, yeah. I mean, so Josh has read three Guy Gavril K books and for my video, they're the three that I recommend to the most people to start with. So I think Got Josh, it. would you agree that all three of them seem like a totally reasonable place to start? Yeah. And I think the, I think the points about the setting is, is very important. Yeah. Cause I think all three are very different. 
But um, yeah, I think they're all fantastic places to start. Yeah. And his writing's incredible. Just pick one yeah. up. Yeah. Whichever one your half price bookstore has, just pick it up, take it home and read but it. There's it so <laughs> many good copies on eBay, like, and they're really cheap. I ended up getting the Song for Arbonne one for like six dollars. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. So check out eBay. <laughs> okay. Well, does anybody uh have about any closing thoughts before we end this discussion? Because we've been going for almost two hours now. This is a contender for my book of the year. Lines of Arasan is, but this one's like a little further ahead. <laughs> Lions is still ahead for me, but I feel like he's, it's the same thing I said for Lions. If you're someone that appreciates prose and if you're someone that appreciates the richness of setting to your story, then this is a good a good book for you. I feel like he researches things so well and it comes through with his writing. So for people that appreciate that, like really you can't, you can't go wrong with picking up the book. You, you say you historically nitpick historical things quite. I do. So, I really, really do. And yeah. I felt like this was once again, very well done. The setting felt very appropriate. Joanna touched upon the Troubadour history in her review, which I thought was excellent. Like the themes are all there. The notes are hit, I think, very well. And like I was saying from differing from history in that I appreciated in this story that he took the religion aspect and kind of spun it on his head and was like, what if? <laughs> you know? And that was really, I enjoyed that so much because even though that hasn't happened historically, we are still in a fantasy setting. And so much of the book is correct that it is kind of fun to play with that what if question and feel Go that team out quarter turn to the fantastical yeah, yeah. to his madness <laughs> exactly so i think it really does add a little flavor to his his telling of it and i appreciate that great and josh i mean and jake sorry <laughs> wrong jay uh I, I don't know if i have much else to add but good uh read read book look at words <laughs> vividly hallucinate <laughs> Yeah, as far as the historical stuff, and all I really know historically about is the troubadour stuff, so I can't really speak to other aspects of the Middle Ages that he caught in France at that time. Um, but I I did find an article, and I didn't get to read it in depth, and then I lost sight of it, but there was an article that I found that talked about some critique of troubadours as being effeminate because they were men who sang songs, kind of like the men in tights kind of you know, thing that people play poke fun at and um and just trying to to reframe our understanding of that and i think that that could be another angle to look at this story because obviously there there could be a way of looking at troubadours i think obviously from one perspective as being you know not very manly not having much valor He's and then reframing that blazes character arc Right through Blaze's character arc, we sort of trans yeah. we transform that perspective, and I think that's really the conversation of gender is super inclusive in this story. In that we we talked about female agency and the ways in which it's displayed in this, but when you're thinking about um, I'm blanking on his name, the husband at the end of the story saying that he just couldn't express himself in song. You know, and like viewing that as a negative thing about himself, like this is what cost him his wife. It's like, like you're saying, that's normally attributed to being rather effeminate. And he's looking at it as a a loss in his category. Like that's a negative strike against him. So yeah, there's definitely, I feel like for both, you're looking at it and flipping things on their heads and it it builds up the questions more. Oh, one little quick historical detail I forgot to mention that I thought that I thought was cool is that I was learning that with the female troubadours, the troubadits, however you say that, that they actually had their songs were more direct and I guess a little less florid and more to the point in the poetry than uh, the male troubadour songs, that they were written slightly differently for females. And I thought that was really interesting because in the book, they actually had some conversation about how the the songs for the female singers were written 
a little bit differently than the male singers. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. It's just a tiny little thing. Nice little detail. Yeah. 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 I like the fact too, that they acknowledge that it wasn't really a woman's job because if we're like looking at real world history in terms of performance and performers, that was a strictly male profession, right? For thousands of years. So it's interesting when we're seeing it from the perspective, mostly of a female in that role. So I thought that was fun too. Yeah, I so add, I like the dude who wants to eat the fish, but can't because of the religion. <laughs> oh, yes. That was so funny. <laughs> I, forgot about that. I love that guy. I got, it felt like such a serious moment. And then he's like, but I just wanted some fish. <laughs> I love how in chapter one, he's on the boat and they're like, yeah, we're fishing for the fish. And he's like, do you have any of the fish? <laughs> and then later you get his perspective. And I love it like, when they were so like, good. it was oddly silent. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes and he goes and like talks and he's expecting to get scolded, but they just found out that our bone got invaded. And he's just like, oh, things must be serious because I was ate the fish and I was not supposed to. And I didn't even get yelled at. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> so funny. Anyway, great humor, great characters, great settings, great prose. Read this book. <laughs> Which you probably have if you're here this long and you're yeah. in the spoiler section. But uh, it was wonderful to read this book and wonderful once again to talk with you three about it. Yeah, so fun. So, Our GDK thank- book club. <laughs> yes, exactly. So thank you all so much. Thank you to everybody in the chat who chimed in. And uh, I'll have all the channels linked below. So please make sure you're subscribed to all these channels because they're all wonderful. And we'll see you in the next one. So have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye.